Has your network been breached? Cyber Reason can help you answer this question. Cyber Reason products hunt for threats within your network and eliminate them in real time. To Cyber Reason, real time means within seconds. Founded by former military hackers who don't play by the rules, they've built this experience into their platform. Harness ingenuity and imagination, not just code, to defeat attackers. Cyber Reason, disrupt the adversary and let the hunt begin. Endgame automates the hunt for both known and never before seen adversaries in enterprise networks. Built on unique knowledge on the adversary's tools, techniques, and tactics, Endgame's centrally managed agent prevents, detects, and responds to advanced adversaries in the earliest stages of the kill chain without prior knowledge. Endgame, automate the hunt. IT Pro TV, an easy, entertaining approach to online IT training. Access over 2,000 hours of up-to-date, high-quality video content live and on-demand via your PC, mobile device, and more. For a free 7-day trial and 30% off the lifetime of your account, visit itpro.tv forward slash security weekly and use the code SW30. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul Security Weekly. Speaking of IT Pro TV, their courses now include Exchange 2016, Wireshark, ECIH, and ECES. IT Pro TV introducing, is introducing a new membership level on March 8th. The new standard membership is $57 a month or $570 a year, includes access to on demand courses, uh, the course library, live chat, and the QA forum. The new premium membership is $85.70 per month or $857 per year and includes access to all of the standard membership features and unlimited transcender practice exams, virtual labs, and access to the enterprise portal. You can download uh, courses with an annual standard or premium membership. So, Mr. Doug White is here. And Doug, I titled this uh, like what not to do in forensics or something like that based on your email. So um, <clears throat> while I freshen up everyone's cocktails, please enlighten us with your wisdom. All right. You, you kids get <laughs> off my lawn. Uh, uh, no, so, so this is about half rant and about half uh, real deal stuff. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, all-star expert witnessing because uh, I used to work for this company, and what they did was we we worked with. I mean, I was we were experts. We worked with experts. We worked with juries. We worked with all kinds of things to evaluate everything and what would become incident response, uh, forensics, all these kind of things. And so I teach forensics all the time to people, and when I teach forensics, so much uh, of of what that is, is about what Alan was talking about earlier, which, which was about being passionate about your trade. But there's this other big chunk of it that the tech people really fail at a lot. And that is really just about uh, reporting. And one of the things that you need to remember uh, in, uh, in your life is that anything you do, whether you're an incident responder, a pen tester, or a forensicator, it could become discoverable evidence in a case. And it doesn't have to be criminal. It could be a civil case. And, and I always worked on civil cases. But all this stuff ends up being uh, about discovery and how you report it. And I saw cases lost because, not because they, they should have been lost, but because the expert wasn't good and because the reporting wasn't good. So I want to talk a little bit about that and show you a case I use in my class and show you just how bad sometimes people write these things and how that can trip you up. And it actually could ruin your career uh, as, as a tech person, because if you can't be hired to be an expert because of past behavior or past actions or being on this show, um, <laughs> you, you literally could, could have your career just get wiped out because of these court records. So I was going to talk a little bit about that uh, on the show tonight, if that's okay with you guys. Go for it. And you're scaring me already. Oh, I hope so. I love to scare everybody. And, and that's, that's one of the things I do. So um, one of the things I would immediately tell you is you can be brilliant. You can be the smartest guy in the room and you can still lose the damn case because you have a problem. The problem is that clown on the other side of the room had better consultants or better writing skills than you did to report this information because you're not reporting it to me and you're not reporting it to Alan White and you're not reporting it to Larry and Paul and, and Jack. You're reporting it and Jeff, sorry, Jeff's out there too. You're reporting it to people that read at a sixth grade level and understand at a sixth grade level. 
And if you can't win those people over, whether they're a jury or it's a detective or it's a security guard or whoever it is, if you can't win them over with what you tell them, you might well lose that case, even if it never goes to court, just reporting back to uh, a company on that kind of evidence. So you need to know who your audience actually is. And when we used to work on these cases, we were always talking about very complex things. And we had a case once where one of the jurors in the case, the rural juror, if you get that reference, but the rural juror was actually illiterate. This person was sitting in a case. The case was about a multi-million dollar antitrust suit. And we were trying to explain advanced statistics economics and mathematics to the jury to get them to rule in our favor. And one of the jurors literally was illiterate. He could not read and write. And they had to have a reader and someone to, to write. And he signed his name with an X. And I'm not making that up. This, it, it was like the most shocking thing I ever experienced. Wait, so wait, to, wait, 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 wait. Ju uh, uh, Jack, your, your jury, of, your jury of your peers. That's all I got to say. <laughs> your, your, your new neighbors, Jack? <laughs> jury of your peers. No, I no. I was thinking <laughs> it's simply Trump supporters. Oh, 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 oh no. Careful, oh, no, careful, no, uh, careful. Okay, death threats, here we come. Uh, I'm, stay, I'm staying out of that. Uh, but but so, so just, just for a second in the audience, imagine that you're trying to explain a zero-day attack or a SHA-1 collision or, or even just what is a flash drive to people that read at a sixth grade level, have dropped out of school in the third grade, and are considered, in your case, a jury of peers for this particular case. And that's where you get into trouble because you tech people love to tell everybody about these really cool things. And, and, and again, I'll put it back to Alan's uh, comment about how you have to be passionate and love your field. And, and I think we all do. And we live this stuff and we breathe it and we understand the lifestyle. And we love to talk about SHA-1 collisions and grinding and BDSM manuals and all these fun things. But when it comes right down to it, you're going to have to write some kind of a brief summation of a very sophisticated technical report that you had actually enjoyed writing and yeah and that's that's the reaction and you're gonna hate it and it, everybody hates it the very best experts i ever saw in court were these two guys who had very different styles but they were they were folksy and they were honest and they were self-deprecating and they won so many cases because they could take the most elaborate complex things and, and sell that to a person who read at a sixth grade level. So my, my point, and we'll, then we'll look at this case because it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of fun, um, is you're going to have to write a summation. Write one. And it needs to be clear and concise. It needs to have facts presented in plain English. I'm reading this off my slide. And you, you're going to have to find a way to gel down all this sophisticated stuff. And this, this is whether you're writing an incident report for the CEO or you're at a, in a court case or wherever you are, and it's got to be in plain English, and you have to strip all this fun stuff out of it and make it so simple that a sixth grader can can sit down and under, and actually a lot of the sixth graders I've met were a lot smarter than most of the jurors I was dealing with. Um, you have to find a way to not attack unless you have a lot of facts to back up what you're going to say, as we'll see in this case I'm going to show you. You can't use jargon and acronyms. As much as we love to talk about the BDSM manual, no one else will know what the BDSM manual is. I'm sorry, Alan. I know I should be plugging Alan's book, and Alan's book is great. I, I, I've read it. It's awesome. I, all of his books are good and useful, so buy one today. But uh, the BDSM manual means something different if you talk to the Army or if you go you know, and talk to people in San Francisco. Um, and I don't know what Jack was doing in Oakland, but you know, it was real. Um, and, and, and my big tip, so, so one of my biggest tips to – It's a big tip. Just, yeah, a tip. just a tip. This is just a tip. Um, is, is to take that summation and read it out loud. And and I do this at my students all the time. And I said at my students. I, I was doing one earlier. I just I go on and I make videos and I read their summations out loud to them and show them all the horrible things they do. And I get to abuse them and, and, and whack, the, you know, just, just grind on them and thrust on them until I can't control myself anymore. And And can the person that's listening to your summation actually explain those findings? Second tip, and that's where it gets complicated and possibly illegal in Georgia. 
Um, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> Please, please don't tease, foreshadow, and novelize what you found. And this is a huge mistake that people make. They 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 try to write a novel or a TV. It's usually more like a TV script instead of actually presenting what was found in, in a clear and concise way. Don't try to use suspense and cliffhangers and vagaries. You got to dig right in. And mostly, then you know, just get the facts on the page. Put them in my face so that anyone can understand them. And that is really, really tough to do. And I had to practice this a lot. And I got yelled at and I got my stuff sent back with bullshit stamped on it. They, with a guy I worked for had a stamp that said bullshit. And I've been trying to find one. But he would stamp that on there and send it back to you and say, no, Doug, I'm sorry. This isn't going to work. No one's going to get this. It, it, you know. <clears throat> Lastly on this, the end of the world. Do not inflame or impugn the subject. This is something people love to do, especially in criminal cases. And you'll see this and, and experts get all excited and start calling people terrorists or calling people bad guys and things like that. Proofread. Oh, my God. I, I cannot stand it. I, had, I read a case not too long ago and the person misspelled uh, the name of the defendant twice. In the first paragraph, and I was like, so you, so, so the, the deposition response to this is if I'm the other side, my deposition response is, so, so you misspelled my client's name. Is that correct? And, and you have no choice but to say, well, yeah, unfortunately, I, I guess I did. That was an oversight. Well, guess what that leads to? So how many other mistakes did you right. make when you analyze this data? So when you were going through this, did you accidentally exclude exculpatory evidence? And my poor innocent client here who molested 35 in a tri-state molestation spree, uh, you know, he, he didn't really do it. And we could prove his innocence if only you hadn't screwed up. And you're going to spend a whole deposition on that. And you, and, you miss, and you mistyped their IP address? Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, you make one tiny mistake like that. You, you screw up the IP address. And you immediately are going to get drawn into this quagmire, jiggity, 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 of, <laughs> of, giggity, of, giggity, of giggity. mistakes that you made. And, and that's going to okay. eat you up. And it's they're okay. going to get on the <laughs> deposition, and they're just going to keep on it and keep on it and keep on it until they get you frustrated and angry. And the minute they get you frustrated and angry in a deposition, you're going to screw up even worse. And now you're going to make even big mistakes. You're going to start doing things that, that are like overreaching. You're gonna you're gonna draw it just it's really really bad. So what I want to show you, uh, and I don't know if they can pull my desktop up, but if they can, I'm gonna have them pull it up. And you need I'm to click a button. You, you need to click a button for that, Doug. It's what you need to click a it's button on your end to share your screen. Here, open this Word doc and enable macros. <laughs> we got this. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm gonna do that. Uh, I'm gonna see here. I have a story about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even sure how to how to do that. I've never done that in Skype. What button do I click? Uh, there's like, is there like a plus symbol at the bottom of your Skype window? There it is. Yeah, click yeah. that. Oh, there it is. I see it. Yeah, got it. Okay. Let it's, me share it's my so, screen. It, it, to, in try, Doug's yeah. defense, that's like the most it's unintuitive oh, it's, thing it's, ever. <laughs> Doug, first, put away. Click the plus symbol, and that allows you to share your screen. <laughs> yeah, well, Doug, Doug first, put they, away they your They apparently, they apparently uh, consulted with Wells Fargo's uh, web Bank. UX developers. <laughs> okay, Morons. I got it. We're good. <clears throat> so let me talk. I want to talk you through this case, and, <laughs> and this case is a setup case. And it's really funny. I'll blow it up a little bit more so you can see it better. Yeah, make um, it bigger. Let's zoom another make time. It bigger. We'll zoom make it bigger. Make it, yeah. make it bigger. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> or get tiny uh, your hands. Ooh. So <laughs> in, in this particular case uh, that the person, and it's, a, it's not a real case, so I'm not revealing some kind of horrible thing. But I made this case just to trip students up, to get them to do something bad. And uh, what I want them to do in this case is I want them to um, – basically conclude that this person is a horrible terrorist and start talking about that. And, and, and this is a, a composite of other people's cases that I put together to show you. And I use this to show my students how not to write summations. So here's what this person, listen to this first paragraph. Now, one thing you need to understand, a jury, a detective, uh, a, a security guard, or whoever's reading this, in this particular case, the person reading this is a security guard, is probably not going to read much further than your summation. They're not going to deep dive on this. And listen to the first paragraph this, that this person chose to lead with. I, Harry Molo, was asked to perform an examination of an exact copy of a flash drive 
that was presented to me by Wolf Technology Security Officer William Felcat misspelled the name of the of the person. He misspelled the guy who hired him's name right there in the very first sentence of this. The drive was found in possession of Wolf Technology, and he misspelled the company name there too, if you see it, because it's spelled differently on the line before. Wolf Technologies employee Paul Gasper, who was seen removing the drive, this thing right here is not even true, uh, against company policy from one of the company computers. Gasper admitted to checking and removing the drive from the system. And I don't even know what this sentence means. And they don't have any evidence of this. And so already in just this first paragraph, you probably lost the case. The security officer is mad. He's, you misspelled the company name at least once. Uh, you you claim stuff that didn't even happen, and you have no references to the evidence. Moving right along. I, I find, Doug, that in, in reports, and, and Larry can probably uh, attest to this, that you only have to misspell the client's name once, and then it's kind of a moot point after that because they're no longer a client. They already threw this in the trash. And, and let me yeah. tell you an even worse thing. No, I'm not saying you've court. done that right, but, yeah, it's it's bad. Yep. If this is a court document, this thing is going to be admitted as a court document, and you can't get rid of it. You can't change it. Mm. So all you can do is put an amendment on it. So that means that forever people will see this, and it's all screwed up right here in the first paragraph, and you're already done. Uh, let me read you. Look at this second paragraph this person wrote. Upon examination of the drive, and now they call it a drive instead of a flash drive, so there's going to be even more confusion, and the poor you know, security guard – who drives a golf cart all day and probably didn't go to you know any advanced technology courses, has no idea what you're talking about. I saw that all the files had been deleted. Okay, well, yeah, all right, that's amazing. I found four items on the drive. I, this is one of my favorite sentences in this case. I, I call these teasers, and it fits right in with Alan's grinding, thrusting, exposing himself, and, and, and so forth. Wow, uh, here's a nice teaser for you. And I'm like, I found four items on the drive. Yay. Dot, dot, dot. Yeah, like, wh what? Okay, great. One file, archive.zip, appeared to have backup copies of all the files that had been on the drive. Okay. No In shit. this file, I found three text documents. And it's just like, what are you telling me here? Is there anything of relevance at all? Um, the documents contained information regarding a computer virus that makes copies of files and sends them to a specified email address, pg at Uh Another text file had a with, with a missing comma had a plan, a plan, or a plan. I'm sorry, a plan. It is spelled right. A plan to release the virus on Guy Fox Day. Now I love this because here's a person in the United States who, instead of reporting the date, decided because the date sort of came from some stuff related to Guy Fox. Just to call it Guy Fawkes Day instead of saying November 5th. And Damn you, send man. explosive devices to two people, Don Ellis and Maria Covarrubias. Now, here's what really happened. So I'm going to tell you what really happened in the case. Uh, in the real case, what was happening, and I'm going to scroll down so I can show you, because the person does have all the evidence here uh, somewhere. Let me find it. Here's what this person used to determine that a, uh, a bomb was going to be sent to two people on Guy Fawkes Day. This picture. Now, my immediate question is, if I'm doing the deposition, is what, what is this exactly? And if you're a really stupid person and a bad expert, you're going to say, it's a bomb. And my next question is going to be, are you an expert on explosives? Now, Alan White is. You heard him. He, was, he, he admitted it on camera. That that he likes explosives for serial killing. So Alan, so I can't. He, uh, sorry, Doug, I can't see the uh, confused the Dwight brothers. Um, I can't see this from where I am. What the heck is it a picture of? Oh, oh yeah, it's, it's. Let me let me see if I can zoom in a bit again. Uh, actually, that's probably the max zoom I can get. Um, it is a picture. I'll describe it forensically. It is a picture of a square device with the letters C four on it. A numerical box that says 02:25. Some colored wires poking into the square rectangular object, and the words "Happy 50th Dawn" written below it on a board in red uh, lettering. Hmm. Now, this person who wrote this forensic report presumed that this was a bomb that was going to be sent to two people on Guy Fawkes Day. But that's not what really happened. 
What really happened was Maria Covarrubias was hired to make a birthday cake for Don Ellis, who worked for the ATF for many years <coughs> and is celebrating his 50th birthday on the 5th of November. Mm. That's not what the person wrote in their forensic analysis. Go back up here, and he says a explosive devices are going to be sent on Guy Fawkes Day. Now, you just lost a case right there because— and, and you're going to get sued because poor old Don Ellis got grounded up by the DHS and dragged off for waterboarding um, where he was accused of being a terrorist by this forensic report. And that this is the kind of overstatement and overreach that you will see forensic experts do if they're not very careful about this, because it's an easy conclusion. And I set it up this way. Every bit of this case was set up to make you fall for this hook, line and sinker that this is a bomb. It's not a bomb. Even if, it's, if it is a bomb, it's a picture. It's not a bomb. There's no bomb here. So that, well, the, ca the case is bomb diggity. The cake is bomb diggity. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, that's the case about is, it. The case is well, the bomb. And Doug, case I, bomb. I think that these are important lessons for when uh, maybe you're not providing expert witness. Maybe you are, but if you aren't, and you're writing a report mm -hmm. for management about an incident that happened, I think you can pull a lot of information from Doug's segment on what to do and what not to do. Right, right, right. Um, I have only been an expert witness once, and it was had nothing to do with computers. It was on automotive-related things. But the one thing that, that I was coached on, which was true, is, like, uh, take a deep breath before you answer the question and, like, run it through your head, like, twice. Because mm -hmm. it... Uh, in cross examination, I, I absolutely, I absolutely agree, Jack. And when we were coaching experts, and when I was doing jury workups, one of the things that we always told people was, it's actually good to, to a lot of people, uh, especially tech people, when they get asked a question, they want to jump right in and, and appear to know the answer. And a lot of beginning experts have that exact response. It's like I don't want to look like I don't know the answer. I, I want to look like, man, I know this answer, you know, right up front. And uh, and, and so it, it actually looks good for a jury to take that deep breath yeah, yeah. And, and, and to spend a second thinking about the answer. That actually, that actually plays very well. And the other thing to Paul's comment is absolutely, when you're writing an incident response report, it's all too often you'll see people use words like hacker and attack and things like that, even when that may not actually be supported by the evidence that you actually have. So as an expert or a reporter, you need to report facts not hyperbole. And that's what this person did right here. And they overstepped this. Now, I'll give you the second deposition. The second deposition is where this person who wrote this report is being sued by Don Ellis for $10 million for defamation and pain and suffering. And my question to that person, that'd be you who wrote this report sitting there, is going to be, so did, did, do you have any knowledge of explosive devices so how did you reach this heinous conclusion that it's destroyed Don Ellis's life and given him PTSD because he was waterboarded for four hours because they thought he was a terrorist? And your answer is not going to be good because your answer is going to be, well, I, it was a picture of something that looked like a bomb. And I'm like, yeah, but it was a birthday cake. Yeah, but it looked like a bomb. Yeah, but it was a birthday cake. And, and on and on. Um, you know, they go on and they just keep up with this sort of whole Thing. So in the next paragraph, they talk about Guy Fawkes Day. And look at this. Never once have they ever mentioned the 5th of November. Yeah, They're just they assuming just, right. that this security <clears throat> guard is, is going to know everything about Guy Fawkes Day. And, th and I like this example because this is a very common technological tech person mistake. They assume, and we all do it, that everyone out there knows everything we know. And they say things like, who doesn't know Guy Fawkes Day? I mean, really, come on. It's like, you know, a national holiday in Great Britain, you know, really. God, and I have two just... of his masks in my office. I mean, geez, who doesn't know? <laughs> of course. And I will admit, Guy Fawkes is certainly better known today than Guy Fawkes was known years ago because of, of, of different groups that wear those masks. And I, I think I have 124 of those masks laying downstairs that I bought for a training exercise with the police, which was really fun. Uh, but they go on, and again, according to plan, now that, now this guy says there's a plan. What plan? When did you show me a plan? There's no plan? You don't have any evidence? I'm getting hysterical because I get so outraged by this stuff. And I would love this if I was working for the other side. He says, according to the plan, Ellis was to receive a bomb at his house. 
There is not one, and I wrote this case, so I know what's there. There's not one shred of evidence that there's a bomb or that there's a plan or that Ellis is going to receive said bomb in his house. But can you imagine this poor security guard reading this and going, wow, it's ISIS. Hmm. I got to call somebody. I'm calling it. I'm calling a DHS. I'm getting them on this. And I could see some overreaction on the part of local authorities and, and even local federal authorities if they receive notification of this. Then I can flip it. Let me flip it and say it really is a bomb and you didn't give them the date, you know, and they go, oh, yeah, well, we're going to get on this. And then they find out, you know, on the 7th of November that maybe that was when the bomb went off was two days ago. Then he goes, it gets even worse. It's this case just keeps going down the drain. All right, la- last point, Doug. Let's. All right, I know. The wor- get to the me, worst part. Let me do this, I won't shut up. Well, so let me make the last point. I'll go back. I'll just go back. Uh, I'll go back to uh, to streaming, I guess. Uh, well, the last <laughs> point is you have got to proofread this stuff, and you've got to rewrite it, and you've got to tell the story. This needs to be told in clear and concise English. It has to be told at a level that anyone can understand. And you have got to avoid making horrific career ending mistakes that are going to get people hurt. So I will make that my last point and I'll stop ranting about this for, for now. Thank you very much, Doug. That was enlightening. Uh, wonderful tips there. Like I said, whether you're an expert witness or writing up incident reports for your organization. With that, we're going to take a short break, come back and talk about the security news for this week.